is shared encoded knowledge. One other thing we think we know is that the incentives for producing this knowledge are abysmal. So uh, here's a Thomas Jefferson quote, of all the things nature has made, knowledge is the least suited to being exclusive property because the moment it's divulged, it forces itself into the possession of everyone and the receiver cannot dispossess himself of it. Um, you can see explicit economic treatments in uh, Richard Nelson, 1959, Ken Arrow, 1962. Uh, because of Arrow's excellent treatment of knowledge as a public goods problem, this is sometimes called the Arovian problem. So this is thing two we think we know. Thing three is that incentives matter. That's often called the core idea of economics, is that you know, people respond to incentives. Well, you stack these three things up and you get something pretty ugly. Uh, we'll call it the triad of stagnation here, right? Wealth comes exclusively from sharing encoded knowledge. The incentives for sharing encoded knowledge are terrible, and incentives matter. Good? Okay. Um, well, that seems to tell us a story that we're quite poor, right? That we're very, very far away from the optimum. If you took away any one of these things, we might be okay. But all three together are pretty bad. Well, so. Positioning off of that, uh, you know, transitioning to NFTs might feel a little weird and, and grandiose, but at least maybe I can convince you it's not so weird, and maybe I don't have to convince people in this room, but uh, the wider world might still think it's weird. I'll at least say that, you know, I'm, we've been beating the drum for a little while, so my original uh, argument on this was uh, in this 2018 essay on NFTs for science, and the pitch was pretty simple. Historically, great knowledge is valued like great art. You can buy a page of Darwin for uh, $100,000. Um, or only if you're willing to pay $100,000, I should say. But today's Darwin isn't hand scrawling notes on the Beagle. Today's Darwin is typing in a version of LaTeX file, like the one I'm presenting to you on, uh, which means you need some sort of digital scarcity. You're, you're losing some sort of manuscript value. And because science funding is so precious, you shouldn't lose any of it. So that's one reason you should do NFTs for science. But there are some other interesting use cases. This one I, I haven't seen, but I think many of you have probably seen um, NFTs as these kind of like permissioning devices for like things related to social tokens where you'll get into a discord and so on. There's a little bit of this tradition in science as well. You may know this quote if you speak ancient Greek, uh, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here. It's supposedly above Plato's Academy. That one is actually really hanging over um, a door in the Santa Fe Institute. So there is some notion of an emergent permissioning that could be created with NFTs. That might be an interesting thing to explore. Um, NFTs as prizes is one thing I'm excited about. And if we have time at the end, I'll try to come back and get to that. Um, but prizes themselves are actually valued by the market. So this is Feynman's Nobel Prize, which sold for uh, almost a million dollars a couple of years ago. Um, and so you, you start to get maybe the potential for a prize to be awarded in exchange for an NFT and value to be created on both sides, which could be a little interesting. Um, so that's ways you could fund science. But I think I promised in the title that I was going to talk about good science. And you know, you give funding, you worry, you know, like new sorts of funding that goes outside of the bounds of conventional science, you worry that you're going to take a shortcut um, on snake oil pass, basically, right? Like, so we have funding is bad in science, but also the system kind of works. Right? People, we know we deny funding for good ideas, but we don't let a lot of terrible stuff slip through for long. But there's a snake oil pass kind of popular way to do science, which can be a little risky. And so to talk about that danger and that risk a little bit, it might help to sort of transition into an example so we can, we can get into ZK proofs without having to look at, uh, you know, the, the crazy moon math. So let me tell you about the story of Seth Roberts. So, Seth Roberts was a uh, Berkeley psychologist. He wrote this paper in Behavioral and Brain Scientists, or Sciences on self-experimentation as a source of new ideas. He exhaustively chronicled all these self-experiments he did. Some worked, some didn't, on improving his sleep, his mood, his health, his weight, etc. He found one thing that worked pretty well. Weirdly enough, he found it here in Paris. It was a, it was a trip to Paris. And he found that drinking new sugary drinks reduced his appetite. And so this connected with some of the like, research he had done on rats and rat appetite and set point fat regulation and some things that honestly I don't know anything about, but he wrote a paper on it. And uh, the idea was that new and unfamiliar calories reduce your appetite. So he's like, okay, well, how do you keep calories from ever being familiar? You maybe make them flavorless so you can never get adapted to them. This was an interesting theory. It garnered a lot of interest and support. You can see the New York Times, CBC, less wrong. A lot of people thought it was interesting. It wasn't really to the level of science. It was self-experimentation, but it was promising. And you can see Aaron Swartz, who I assume you know, many people know in here, 
you can see this beautiful uh, like succession of blog posts on his website, Raw Thought, where he's like, I'm a pretty skeptical guy, but I got to admit, this is intriguing enough to try. Then three months later, he's like, this is crazy. This is the easiest thing I've ever done. I lost, a, I lost 20 pounds, blah, blah, blah. And then next week, he writes, a future without fat. OK, we've solved. As soon as the clinical trials for this thing roll out, we're going to realize we've all just solved this thing. What's the world going to look like? Like this ridiculous level of uh, of excitement and, and optimism that I think is, is, is characteristic of how, how great he was. But um, the clinical trials didn't happen, right? Like, you can speculate about reasons. I have my own. One thing is a flavorless calorie is just hideously unpatentable, right? There's so many ways you can, uh, you can literally hold your nose and eat evidently. And so this never really became a finding. We don't know if it works. I mean, I'm telling you it's compelling. The evidence seems interesting. It's anecdata. But it has never been validated via NRCT. Well, so um, we, did, we, we have started to bridge this gap. We ran a crowdsourced kind of Web3 style study where the participants were awarded NFTs. And we had some kind of Web3 legends uh, like Zuko from Zcash uh, help out a little bit and, and publicize it. And the results look pretty promising. So um, I won't get into this too much now, but you're welcome to, to ping me if you want to discuss it. This is an NFT of the results. It looks pretty good. Again, I would not say it's a scientific finding, but we, we sold this NFT for $24,000. That money is going to fund a replication, which should start running here in the next couple weeks. And uh, that hopefully will be able to validate whether this is a full-on scientific finding that people have been sort of clamoring for an RCT on for 15 years, or debunk it as pseudoscience, um, which we should do as well. Because of course, you know, this is science we're doing here. We're not trying to just raise the banner on this weird old theory. It might be, uh, it might be wrong. Um, so I, I mentioned all this in the last slide. Results look pretty good. Not satisfactory evidence. We're running the replication. Had tip to Austin Griffith for uh, helping with the uh, NFT distribution and burner wallets. Um, but so I just told you about this data. It's really hard to convince people to not only drink olive oil to test some old theory, but to also be willing to let you share their health data with everybody and share an open data set, especially if you're just some guy on the internet like I was. So there was nat this natural problem. I mean, I say my data says this, but how would you know? Well, zero knowledge proofs help us here. And uh, it, goes just beyond, it goes beyond even the sort of like HIPAA health, uh, health permissioning sort of stuff. This is endemic to science. Even when you have the rights to share, this is a really, really common occurrence, right? So you see a paper that says data available on request, and then they'll just never let you take a look at it. Um, so a lot of times you have to trust. You can't really validate this stuff. Now, sometimes trusting isn't a problem. You can see I promised here on June 19th I was going to include this slide, and you just saw I did. So clearly, I'm like a very trustworthy individual. But you know, other scientists, not so sure. So we do these, uh, these zero knowledge proofs, and we ran this uh, with collaboration with Alio. And we wrote it in the Leo language. And, and basically, we were able to provide these two statisticians um, a proving key along with um, the proof that the slope of the line was what we said it was, the slope of treat on uh, hunger, which is to say the result that we were describing in that earlier NFT. And this is a pretty cool thing, because it allows you to validate the claims and produce a proving key that sort of like preserves some of the structure of the data without having to reveal it. Because the truth is, like, as much as we want people to share data, data is extremely expensive. Right? People will pay $100,000 for a data set, and they don't want to share it with their first result. They want to share it the way when they often do share it the way like a lion shares a carcass or something, where like when they're good and done with it and they found all the good results, you know, you're welcome to step in. But before that, maybe not so. So it's nice to be able to validate this stuff. Um, we published a nice piece on this. Well, I mean, I think it's nice. Um, and here's, here's statistician Harry Crane, who collaborated, saying they were able to independently validate the test of Seth Roberts' appetite theory. It's a big step in open science. Um, kind of a cool thing. Um, and so that's, that's a couple of things. That's, that's NFT tech. That's zero knowledge proof tech. There's some other cool projects that are going on in the space. Um, let me expand on this. So Vita DAO, which I, I think I need to lose that space in there. Um, this has NFTs as patent holders. So like the NFT can actually hold the patent itself, which is a really cool thing. And uh, I think Paul published on this really early too, which is uh, cool. We have Ants Review, um, and, and Bianca is in the audience with us here. Very cool uh, incentives for peer review, which is a sort of nightmare problem in, uh, in academia, and an amazing thing to be solved. 
Um, Experiment.com, they're doing NFTs for scientific proposals, which is a really cool thing. Um, so the proposal itself gets NFT'd and people can sort of own it as a badge. Um, OpScientia is doing data wallets. And then uh, Research Hub has uh, structured ERC20 incentives for publication. So all this stuff is pretty cool. I think there's a lot of exciting tech to do good science with. Um, one of the things that I'm not going to get into, oh, I, I should also mention an NFT of um, some Nobel Prize winning research sold um, in May. This was, uh, this was out of Berkeley, but that was a, that was a really cool thing, sold for $50,000. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about that I won't get into right now because of time constraints and complexity, but I would love to talk to anybody about is we're um, launching a system of self-funding prizes. Um, and this uses some interesting Web3 tech, notably um, smart contract commitment in addition to some of these NFT techs we, we talked about earlier. But I want to close by highlighting something that I think would be easy to sort of forget about that's maybe the big deep secret advantage for doing science in Web3. And that's ultimately the culture, right? Uh, we're, we're lucky to have people heading up some really cool organizations who are deeply committed and interested in science. So obviously the most prominent figure in Ethereum, Vitalik, you know, he publishes stuff in economics. He writes on cryptography. There's a lot of value on cryptography, computer science, incentive design, mechanism design in the space. And that's a really cool and, and treasured kind of thing. So I think all these things combined, it makes the, uh, the frontier of doing science, especially with these Web3 tools, a really promising thing. Uh, we're seeing increasing interest. I, I mentioned that uh, prize. We have, I'm collaborating with uh, researchers at Santa Fe Institute, um, Columbia, Harvard, a few others are involved in that. So, and these are, these are researchers in the institutions. So they're, they're coming around and, and getting excited about this, even though, you know, when you talk to them about it in May, they were just wanting to ask about people. Um, they're, they're, they're seeing. So anyway, um, thank you all very much for coming out. And hopefully, this will be, uh, let's see, DSI summer. <laughs> Turns out there's a question. <laughs> Are there any uh, live uh, experimentation going on with zero knowledge proofs and NFTs that you can point us to? Uh, can you say more? The, just the, the broad application is actually super interesting and it could be anything from, you know, people don't want to know that they own this piece of art to, you know, real estate to uh, even the science stuff. It, just the idea that NFTs could transfer ownership, could allocate economic benefits, but you don't necessarily need to know specifics yeah. unless it's open to you by the owner. So, I mean, we did do it. We did do the experiment and actually did do the zero knowledge proof. We okay. sold the NFT, I didn't mention this in the slide, but we sold the NFT of the independent data analysis that was done CK proofed. Okay. That sold for, I think, 5000 or something, but it's, I promise it's the first time the market's ever valued an independent data analysis. So it's Ongoing experiments, I don't know, but I will say Alio has the code up for linear regression so you can do it. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of interest. My suspicion is you'll be hearing a lot more about this stuff, but I don't know if they have the broad ones. Okay, if there's any links or anything that you can share. If there's any links or anything that you can share later or yeah. privately, or that yeah. would be great. Um, get, you can get in touch. Or, uh, yeah, we can <coughs> yeah. Oh, here's the mic. Oh, this mic works too. Okay, amazing. Both. Hi, thank you. Um, great presentation. My question would be, um, what do you feel like is the most useful function of NFT in funding science? So you've said this NFT was sold for quite a lot of money, 24,000. What does it actually represent? Like it could also represent an IP like with VitaDAO. What other ways do you see NFTs could be used and what's the most useful? Yeah, it's hard to answer what's the most useful, but I mean, certainly holding real IP is, it, th that's an interesting use case, an actual patent, right? Um, but I, I do think it's interesting, and in, in particularly the way we've gone has been to focus on um, alt IP. So there's no, there's no actual legal right conferred. So when we sold it, it's just, you own the concept of the result. In the same way that when you own a page of Darwin, you don't 
own the theory of evolution. You own something connected to it. The theory of collectibles, if you'll let me nerd out a little bit, says that what's going on is that there is a biographical indexicality that gets created when people own something and collect it. I know that's like a $10 word, but this is a science talk, so you should be able to be cool with it. Um, basically, we like objects, we like things that connect to important periods of our lives, to important periods of history, and so on, right? The sweater our grandma gave us, the origin of the theory of evolution, and so on, right? So if NFTs are capturing this sort of like connection in the same way, you know, the connection to the artist's original signature or the uh, emergence of this idea, then we think those, those things parallel pretty well. And you can get this interesting kind of like manuscript value where you own something that is increasing in value, at least personal value, as the idea takes hold. So we hope that the person who owns this NFT will come to treasure it more and more if it so happens that this theory is validated, right? I mean, if it's this world-changing theory like Swartz that it said it was, I think it's really cool to hold this NFT, right? So that gives you something like a flavor of the patent structure in terms of being able to reward early basic shared research without the government enforced exclusivity. So somebody can start an extra light olive oil company tomorrow and none of us have any claims against them, right? Yes, thank you. Where do you see it be useful? I'll repeat for the recording. Uh, how do you see the change of, um, how do you see the government enforced um, exclusivity rights and so on changing in the future thanks to Web3 and crypto? And do you think there are opportunities to actually improve science through those mechanisms? Yeah, that's a, that's a great and big question. I'll try to do, do it justice. I mean, Patents are not that old, and people have complained about them since the very beginning, right? <laughs> and so certainly there are, people are well aware of the limitations of the system. I think understanding the reasons they exist and the problem they're trying to solve, which is what I tried to get at, at, at the beginning, and I know you're well aware of, of course, um, this idea of ensuring that shared high fixed cost knowledge is rewarded and preserved over time, at least through attribution, but hopefully through some bare minimum, Insofar as that solves the problem that patents are trying to solve, I would expect you know the role of patents to reduce, right? Like because it's a it's a costly, you know, centralized, very imperfect sort of structure, right? Will it always have its uses? I mean, I can't say. I, I certainly would expect in the near term patents are patents are here to stay, and you know, I think there's a lot of use for those projects. But I think it would be really cool to do something that served what the, the purpose of patents without it having to be this centralized exclusive thing. You can kind of get the dream of the open internet where you're able to share this thing openly, everybody can use it immediately, but you also get rewarded, right? Similarly with patents. So, yeah, thanks. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, in uh, the context of uh, what you did with this uh, uh, ZK proof, like you can prove that the computation was done correctly, but what about proving that the data is the correct data? Like, is there anything about, you know, maybe like having um, the participants in the in the study somehow have I don't know some input that validates that you know the the data that you actually provide the proof for is the correct one or whatever, some kind of thing of, of the along these lines. I think that's that's a really interesting idea. Um, and I haven't thought of that, but the idea that the individuals who participate in the study would in some sense validate it. I mean, it does just push the trust problem further upstream, but it does, you know, arguably decentralize it, which could be kind of cool. To your point about ZK proofs, absolutely true. I will say that, um, uh, and just to be clear, his point is that, um, yes, you can tell that the data says what I, says it, or, uh, what I, what I say it does, but uh, you can't tell whether the data is real or not. The, the work that I've seen done on what actual like p-hacking and like falsification of research is, is it's very rare for scientists to just outright make up a data set. It happens, but it's extremely rare. What's more common is this sort of like subtle, I'm gonna drop this outlier, I'm gonna modify this when the referee tells me to do something, right? Like it's, it's this more subtle psychological process that I think we can all sort of intuitively recognize when we're tempted to do something we know is wrong. You kind of like massage it, and so, Sharing a totally fraudulent data set, you'd certainly see it, and ZK proofs can't catch you on that. Uh, but I think the much more common, and here I'm citing work from, uh, from Andrew Gelman, um, who runs StatsBlog, uh, the, the idea that there's more, it's closer to a garden of forking paths, where as you deal with the data, you start to make decisions unconsciously or subconsciously or semi-consciously that push you toward your results. Now, I think ZK proofs can help with that, especially as the process is iterated, right? If somebody says like, well, what about this? What about this? You can't go back and change your data after the fact. Does that, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah thank okay, you. great. Good, all right. Thank you.